All right, hi everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Compass. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Leah Chomiak, who uh, is a fifth year PhD student in MPO. Uh, before coming here for her PhD, she was uh, still at the University of Miami for her undergraduate degree. Um, she's now jointly advised by uh, Ben Kurtman and Dennis Volko, uh, and she defends in one month on May 8th, so it's really exciting. Uh, her research is broadly large-scale ocean circulation of the deep Atlantic Ocean, like you can see here. And when she's not doing research, she loves spending time outdoors with her dog. And a fun fact about Leah, she lives on a sailboat. So with that, I'll hand it off to Leah. Okay. Thank you, Lillian. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. Uh, Going to give an overview of basically what I've been up to for the past five years, um, doctoral research looking at the advection of some polar climate signals from a subtropical Atlantic viewpoint. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk today. Start with the introduction, um, and then get into the three major parts of all of these works, um, followed by conclusion. Um, so first, we'll start with an introduction. So the primary aim of all these studies are to gain understanding visualization and quantification of the evection of subpolar climate signals from the formation in the subpolar North Atlantic to the subtropical Atlantic through direct observation of the evective spreading pathways. And so what do we mean by subpolar climate signals? These are what we define as the convectively formed water masses that are generated in the subpolar North Atlantic, such as lavender seawater, which are uniquely identified by their anomalously low salinity and temperature, high gas content, low potential vorticity, um, and can follow that throughout the North Atlantic. Why do we care about these? Um, through these forthcoming novel implications, the improved understanding on advective time scales, pathways, variability, and importance of these subpolar climate signals in the North Atlantic serve to benefit the greater AMOC community um, and AMOC validation itself, which is a critical component of Earth's climate system. Um, so through these next three parts, we'll focus on looking at the advection of subpolar climate signals through the deep western boundary current across the entire North Atlantic, and then locally at 26 and a half north, looking at variability there. So to start, meridional overturning circulation is basically the global circulatory system of all of our oceans. Um, it's responsible for global ocean circulation in all basins on time scales of thousands of years. Com it's comprised of upper and lower limbs, consisting of surface and deep currents, it plays an integral role in the regulation of the global climate through uh, heat and freshwater fluxes. And there are notable deep water formation zones in the North Atlantic, shown here um, in the subpolar North Atlantic, as well as the Nordic Seas, and in the Southern Ocean off of Antarctica, which serve as the drivers for this MFC, um, kind of like driving this comparable like circulation. In the Atlantic, we refer to this overturning as AMOC, the Atlantic Marine Overturning Circulation where upper limb consists of the Gulf Stream and North Atlantic Current, and the lower limb is the Deep Western Boundary Current. The Deep Western Boundary Current, shown here in yellow, uh, is a major transporter of newly formed North Atlantic deep water and is a driving force of the AMOC here in the Atlantic. It's monitored through numerous observing platforms and repeat hydrographic endeavors along the North Atlantic for its transport and variability. Now these deep waters that are formed in the subpolar North Atlantic are of special importance because we can use them as advective tracers due to their known water mass properties. Um, so previous um, studies have looked at modeling efforts to understand effective time scales going from the subpolar North Atlantic to the subtropics and found about four years based on velocity models. Um, whereas when you look at advective tracer studies, you can then, uh, you see that time scale becomes much longer, eight to 10 years. And so the understanding of these time scales and the pathways of these lower water, these lower limb, deep water masses and the circulation thereof is very critical for AMOC research. So the subpolar North Atlantic is the region where these warm saline upper ocean waters from the tropical latitudes meet the cold fresh outflows from these high polar latitudes. Um, we get major intermediate and deep water masses that are created, modified, and joined together which form collectively the lower limb of the AMOC. And this, these newly formed North Atlantic deep water masses are collectively exported out of the subpolar North Atlantic at depths below 1,000 meters. However, the, ex the exact pathways and time scales of these southward spreading components are not yet fully understood. 
Um, so a notable component of North Atlantic deep water is Labrador seawater, which is formed in the Labrador Sea through wintertime infection. Um, it's shown to spread out of the Labrador Sea into the other basins of the subpolar Atlantic, but notably through the deep western boundary current um, along the coast, the western coast of North America. Um, the intensity, the depth, the volume, and resulting classification of these newly formed Labrador seawater masses are dependent on a multitude of things, including air, sea, heat, and freshwater fluxes, local and regional wind patterns in the area, the inflow of Arctic sources, freshwater rivers, continental runoff, um, advection of heat and salt by the subpolar gyre itself, and also preconditioning from prior convective events in the Labrador Sea. And so shown here is just a little schematic of kind of how Labrador Sea water is formed each year. And so in the wintertime months, we have the greatest amount of convection, um, where we have enhanced surface heat loss and intense convection in the upper thousand meters. Now convection is the vertical movement of heat. So uh, in the wintertime, we have lots of storms, lots of wind, lots of precipitation, lots of mixing, where we drive this homogeneous layer um, in the upper surface ocean in the Labrador Sea. And at the end of the winter, this mixed layer now becomes what we call Labrador seawater and its thickness and layer properties are dependent on that convective period. And so then, once the warm season comes back, surface heating drives the formation of a new mixed layer atop of that previously formed lava seawater mass, and we get what's called restratification. Um, so as you can see, looking at every single year here, the, the uh, properties observed of different lava seawater classes vary based on the convective season. Um, so sometimes you get uh, very fresh or very cold labrador sea water masses that are formed, but they're all uniquely identifiable based on the convective conditions. And so, like I just mentioned, seasonal convection, pre-existing environmental conditions can produce these labrador sea water masses that are marked with distinctively low salinity, low temperature, low potential vorticity, and high density characteristics. So we can see here in the late 1970s, there was a convective event producing the labrador sea water class of 1976. Um, in the 80s to the mid-1990s, we had the largest convective event producing lava seawater of the 90s, again in the early 2000s, and more recently in the later half of the 2010s. So the reduction in the volume of these convectively formed lava seawater masses with time suggests that lava seawater is exported out of the region, and its voids filled with other warmer and salty water masses from the subpolar North Atlantic itself. And lava seawater has been observed to advect into the subpolar North Atlantic, um, to the Erminger and Iceland basins, as well as into the central um, subpolar gyre. It's been observed to be entrained into the deep layers of the North Atlantic current, as well as make its way into the central Atlantic, and obviously equatorward via the deep western boundary current. Um, the variability and transport of the deep western boundary current have been monitored through use of repeat hydrograph repeat hydrogra hydrography and mooring lines at various latitudes spanning the North Atlantic Western Continental Slope. Um, and these have shown slowing or even temporary reversals in transport. We've seen offshore meandering of the current away from the continental shelf. Um, we've also seen studies with theorized recirculation patterns within the North Atlantic, um, branching off the deep western mountain current, and the localized changes in the source region of the transported North Atlantic deep water in the subpolar North Atlantic kind of having a, a driving feature of variability in the uh, deep western run current. And this has kind of been thought to be linked with North Atlantic oscillation patterns as well. However, given the unique properties of Labrador seawater, being the low salinity temperature, the high density, low potential vorticity, high gas tracer, we can then use these Labrador seawater masses, which are different with each convective season, as convective fingerprints to gauge advective time scales and spreading pathways as they propagate out of the region. So previous studies um, in the North Atlantic have basically used these convective fingerprints uh, to document observable property shifts in lavender seawater through the deep western boundary current advection, attributing the onset of a cold, fresh signal as the arrival of the lavender seawater signal. So in the late 90s, studies out of Bermuda figured or determined that there was a six year advective time scale going from the subpolar North Atlantic with the Labrador Sea arriving in Bermuda. It took six years. Studies, early studies at 26 and a half north off the Abaco um, Island of the Bahamas uh, documented a 10 year advective time scale. 
studies looking to the equator found 20 years. Uh, more recent studies looking off of Cape Cod using the line W hydrographic line determined seven years to get to Cape Cod. Um, and the most recent update from 26 and a half north occurred in 2011. Um, they also found a 10 year invective time scale. But since that last publication, we've now have 10 more years plus of hydrographic data at this location. So this serves as a huge motivator to look back and see um, if we can update these time skills based on more data availability. So the 26 and a half north hydrographic line has been quasi annually surveyed since 1985 um, through present day as a joint effort between the NOAA Western Boundary Time Series Program, the Rosenstone Mocha Array, and the UK Rapid Program to assess the strength of the AMOC at this latitude through repeat hydrographic surveys and mooring installations. Um, so given the first decade of data, Molinari et al. in 1998 discovered the onset of a cold fresh anomaly within the lavender seawater layer beginning in the late 1990s. Um, and they attributed the onset of this cold and fresh signal to formation in the lavender sea 10 years prior. So basically that signal making its way all the way down from the subpolar of the Atlantic. Um, like I mentioned in 2011, Nancy basically revisited this time series um, with an additional decade of data and found that that cold and fresh signal continued to persist through the uh, lavender seawater layer. And they determined still a 10 year effective time scale to reach this latitude. They also looked at um, a velocity model where they indicated that it would take four years for a parcel to go from the lavender sea to um, the abaco line based strictly on velocity. So four years versus 10 years, that gives us kind of room for a lot of questions. And so here we are present day, we have an additional decade of hydrographic data at this line. Um, and what we see first and foremost is the complete passage of this anomalous signal with a return to warm and saline conditions. And so this is kind of the motivation of the entire dissertation and all my work, um, basically where do these signals come from? On um, what time scales? And does this play a role in lower limb circulation? Because we know that the deep western boundary current regulates this in the Atlantic. So this segues into our second part. Um, so for this study, we look not only at the Abaco 26 and a half north hydrographic line, we also look upstream, starting at the Lavender Sea, um, compiling basically every hydrographic observation available, um, going back to the 1970s. And then we look along the theorized classical um, pathway of the deep western mountain current, where it intercepts the line W hydrographic line, located here off of Cape Cod. Um, and now to kind of validate, you know, hypothes hypothesize theories of um, interior recirculation of branching from the deep western mountain current, we look at hydrographic data from Bermuda, which is in the interior Atlantic Ocean. So using all these four different sections, we can start to see um, the propagation of these anomalies. So first and foremost, we have to define lavender seawater. And previous studies, previous papers, um, have defined it in a multitude of ways, often conflicting and not uniform at all. Um, studies have looked at it in potential density, uh, neutral density, in depth space, um, classifying it by types of lavender seawater, where Notably, we have a, a water mass called classical lavender seawater, which could mean a variety of different things. There's also upper and deep lavender seawater, um, as well as vintage class um, classification systems. Um, these previous defini definitions are inconsistent across multiple geographic locations and do not work interchangeably um, when you look across the entire basin. Um, and so to do this, we introduce new cohesive density definitions and neutral density space. So like I mentioned about the inconsistency of definitions across different studies, shown here are just a couple of different example studies versus the new density definitions that we set in this study. Um, these previous effective studies have defined lavender seawater based on the arbitrary layers of classical lavender seawater, upper and deep lavender seawater. And oftentimes they were specific to the local conditions um, and not met further up or downstream. And they are all inconsistent. So you can kind of see um, across all the studies, the different shaded areas bounding all the hydrographic profiles here across all the four locations and how they vary. 
sometimes not even capturing the true convective you know, event itself. Um, so then when you factor this into modeling studies and you know, big scale implications, how, are, how can we justify that these density definitions are capturing what we actually see? So um, in this study, we, we, class, we reclassify using an all-encompassing approach and constant neutral density definitions defining three separate layers, an intermediate, deep, and abyssal layer. And this intermediate layer encompasses all lab or seawater classes um, captured in the 40-year um, hydrographic data set in the lab or sea, and is consistent when you look downstream across Line W, Bermuda, and Abaco. So with these three layer definitions, we can then start to look at anomalies as they propagate through all of these selected locations. You can see in the lab or sea that major salinity and temperature anomaly, the big blue blob um, in the intermediate layer defined by these dashed lines. You can see that this anomaly starts to propagate through line W, through Bermuda, and Abaco. So we can see this cold and fresh anomaly propagating through, and with that we can start to gauge some visual advective time scales. Um, so also within this intermediate layer that we're defining, there are two separate labor seawater masses of interest. Um, so going back, talking about different convective periods, how they're all generated differently, we have the really deep uh, flower seawater class of the 90s, which we can identify along the neutral density isopycnol 27.99. And then we have a shallower class of the 2000s that we can define along um, 27.9. So going forward, we now follow the advection of both of these labor seawater masses both looking at a layer standpoint, so looking at the entire intermediate layer itself, and also looking within the layer at these two separate lab or seawater classes to see what the effective time scales say. Um, so in the process of doing this, it became apparent that a, there was a shift in density when you look downstream at locations um, south of the lab or sea. So basically when we define, we pinpoint the two different lab or seawater classes on their neutral density cores, when you take that same core and you look downstream at line W, for example, the core of the you know, potential temperature and salinity anomaly was higher in density, or lighter in density, than what the actual signal should have been. Um, so what we did, we applied an offset to locations all downstream of the lab or C to make this on a uniform density plane. Um, but what is the cause of this offset? Why is it offset? Um, it's most likely caused by mixing, but that is kind of not determined from this study alone. It requires a lot of further investigation. Um, but we can speculate that there is modification and mixing with surrounding intermediate waters. Like as lava seawater propagates down, it's modified by different waters. Um, we see the largest jump in temperature and salinity once the water masses leave the lava sea between getting there and line W, whereas when we look downstream, there's a much smaller and less significant jump in temperature and salinity. So that suggests that the largest amount of mixing occurs once out of the subpolar North Atlantic, um, most likely from slope water interference or um, just subtropical gyre interaction. Um, so Mediterranean overflow water and lab or sea water occupy pretty much the same density surface in the North Atlantic, um, so it's therefore plausible to suggest that there is a large Mediterranean overflow water influence on Labrador seawater once it's exported out of the region. Um, Van Sibyl et al. in 2011 looked at this relationship um, using some salinity data, data from models um, and determined a uh, Mediterranean water mixing influence of 20% at this uh, 26 and a half north within the Labrador seawater layer, which is considered to be negligible. Um, but Going forward with all this information for our study, we decided to basically uh, determine cutoffs for Mediterranean overflow water characteristic profiles in all of our data sets and we'll omit them from the data set itself so that we are focusing truly on the lab or seawater signal and omitting any influence um, thereof. So to do that, we define basically a layer that encompasses the entire intermediate layer, both above and below a little bit, to capture the different layers um, and then we look at um, temperature and salinity cutoffs within all the data points in those layers throughout the years. So you can see, for example, here, this is a perspective from um, the Abaco data set where we had cutoffs of 4.3 degrees 
and 35.01 salinity. So any data point that was above that threshold was removed from the data. And so in doing so, omitting all that salty and warm water, that now brought our mean state back to what is more representative of um, lab or seawater. And so all data used in this entire analysis is subject to this um, removal scheme, and that's just to get um, the true signal of lab or seawater and not be skewed by Mediterranean influence. And so these are the percentages of data removed. Um, Bermuda had the highest percent removed, but that's due to its interior location, most likely. Um, so anyways, now, moving forward with this intermediate layer that we defined, we can now look at how that changes um, as we make our way down to 26 and a half north, where once we had a layer of 1800 meters that compressed all the way to 800 meters um, based on density definitions once you get to Abaco, and that's likely due to um, PV compensation as that's going under the subtropical gyre. Um, we can also define this layer by its minimum in PV, which is shown um, panel B across each location. And so then using this defined intermediate layer, we can then look at the temperature and salinity trends with time. And so starting in the Labrador Sea, we see the initial minimum occur in the mid 90s, and we can follow that minimum as it propagates further down these latitudes, um, giving a three year adductive time scale to get to line W, a nine to 14 year to get to Bermuda, and similarly, a nine to 14 year to Abaco. So now, maybe you're thinking, that's weird. Why do we see the exact same signal at Bermuda and Abaco? Bermuda's not even in the deep western mountain current at all. It's 1,400 kilometers away. Interesting, right? Um, and so this, uh, backtrack and say this layer estimate, since we're including all uh, classes of lab or seawater, can be kind of inconclusive because we're taking an average of all these lab or seawater layers. So if we look specifically at the two separate classes that we classified, we can start to gauge different invective time scales. Um, so shown here are the two Labrador seawater cores looking at their temperature and salinity minimum. Um, and we can see right off the bat that the deeper class advects quicker than the shallower class. Um, where we're finding that the class from the 2000s is taking um, on the order of five years longer to adapt to these locations as opposed to the class from the 90s. Um, and when we correlate the arrival of the minimum to that of the Labrador Sea for both of these cores, we can see again that the shallower core or the light shaded peaks um, occur much later than the deeper ones. So this suggests that we have two separate um, advective timescales happening here. We can also look at the entire layer itself, where again we see the same confirmation of the advective time scales between the two separate lab or seawater classes. Um, <clears throat> so we can look now looking at uh, adjusted geostrophic velocities that are derived from Argo and altimetry um, at different depth layers throughout the North Atlantic domain to kind of determine what's going on here. Um, so if you look at the 1500 and 1750 meter panels, which are representative of the two ladder seawater classes, you can see that there are multiple different pathways, excluding um, or branching from the deep western boundary current, um, where you can see water is basically rerouted into the interior off of Cape Hatteras here, passing Bermuda, and then Abaco in the process. Um, there's still speculation whether or not a, a direct pathway going from Cape Hatteras to Abaco exists, um, and it's difficult to ascertain using Argo data um, so close to the coast here, but that's what we're trying to look for. Um, so takeaways from this study is that we observed Labrador seawater class of the 2000s to affect on longer and more varying time scales compared to the deeper and denser class. Um, we see almost simultaneously overlapping arrival at Bermuda and Abaco, despite being so far apart, um, which suggests that both classes may advect along different pathways given their differing time scales. Um, an alternative advective pathway branching from the deep western boundary current is likely to exist. Um, so these are all just the advective estimates from this study. Um, so basically, since we look now locally at the deep western boundary current and we're hypothesizing whether or not an interior recirculation exists. Now we look at the Atlantic interior 
Um, so based on the varying and effective time scales of these two louder seawater classes and the support of those geostrophic velocities, um, this interior pathway likely exists for into the deep western mountain current. So we now investigate using um, ice pignal plains across the entire North Atlantic, where we can answer the big picture question of whether we can observe lava seawater spread outside of the deep western mountain current, branching into the ocean interior, um, or are there other spreading rafts, period. So to do this, we utilize normalized salinity anomaly fields of the North Atlantic domain to wrap from the and 4 gridded observations, um, where we take uh, a climatological mean, which is between 2003 and 2021, and this is determined based on observational weights from the EN4 data set. So basically, looking at all years, starting from 1990, profiles that have at least 50% weighted coverage throughout the entire domain, um, we consider that, but the top 50% of those 50 percenters um, is what we use to determine our climatological mean period. Um, so that starts 2003 to 2021, where we then take anomalies using these means of salinity, temperature, um, and depth. Um, and to, count, to account for this neutral density offset that was discussed in the previous part, um, we average the isopycnal planes um, 0 0.02 kilograms per meter cubed above the core isopycnal because we don't want to completely offset the subpolar signal, since that we know that that's true. Um, so we average over a variety of different planes with that limit to account for this offset as it flows downstream. Um, so with these interpolated planes, these are the two depths of these two isopycnal planes as they go throughout the entire Atlantic. Um, so these are what the lava seawater classes that affect the pond. Um, and then we can generate salinity anomalies from those climatological means to then gauge their advective uh, propagation. So looking here, um, the top panel shows the formation of the Labrador Sea water class of the 90s and the Labrador Sea. We can see this anomaly or this blue fractioning signal to propagate out of the Labrador Sea into the eastern subpolar, down the western boundary, and as well as maintain itself within the Atlantic interior. Um, likewise for the class of the 2000s, we can see it form atop of the previous um, Labrador seawater class of the 90s uh, on its shallower isopycnal. And again, we see that same fashioning anomaly to propagate out of the Labrador basin into the eastern subpolar Atlantic down the western boundary, and as well as hang out inside of the Atlantic interior as well, kind of supporting that hypothesized um, recirculation pathway branching from the deep western boundary current. So using these anomalies, we can now look at a um, complex imperial orthogonal function, which gives us the ability to detect spatial and temporal propagation of these anomalies as they spread across the North Atlantic. And to kind of break this down for everybody, when we look at our real component, or our zero degree rotated, you can see that in the subpolar North Atlantic, we have a maximum freshening, or the blue signal, which is corresponding to um, mid-1990s, where that's our peak formation or peak freshening of lavender seawater, which makes sense. Um, conversely, for the class, class of the 2000s, we see that peak freshening occurring in the 2000s, which is when this lavender seawater class was formed. Now, if we look at our 90-degree rotated phase, we can <coughs> see this, the propagation of this anomaly as that the blue shadings um, goes into the eastern subpolar, down the western boundary, and into the Atlantic interior with time scales that are about 10 years after the formation. And for the shallower class, we see five to 10 years later. Um, from this information, we can also gather phase cycles. So our deeper class, we see two complete phases with about 16 years in duration, whereas the shallower class, we see only about one and a half um, with what appears to look like a stall in the phase propagation here which could be indicative of it recirculating within the Atlantic interior during that time. Um, we also compare lavender seawater propagation and the NAO index, where we find a 0.7 correlation between both ice pycnal levels, and both ice pycnal levels lag the NAO formation by four years, or are formed four years after an NAO, positive NAO. Um, but however, this is insignificant due to our uh, 
lack of cycles. So we just need a lot more data in order to really discern any relationship. Um, in addition to these complex spatial temporal propagations, we look at cross sections of hydrographic data collected by the GoShip program, um, where we find lavender seawater to nearly cover the entire western half of the Atlantic Basin. Um, so looking zonally from, uh, from lines AO3, we can see that the freshen, fresh anomaly, so the blue, um, extends all the way from the western boundary to about 40 degrees west, likely uh, caps by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge there. We can also see that it extends meridionally from the western boundary to about 35 north, and in some cases 32 north, which 32 north is the latitude of Bermuda. So we can start to see indications of the recirculation of that flow based on the salinity anomaly here. And we can also see the southward protrusion of lavender seawater from the eastern subpolar North Atlantic from the A16 line, um, and it, that extends as far south as 40 degree north. Um, so then, kind of revisiting what we did in the first part, taking these uh, geostrophic velocities, but now interpolating them onto the two isopycnal planes of each respective lavender seawater class, we can start to visualize um, the spreading pathways of these two classes. And the takeaways are that it's not only bound to the western boundary, we see lavender seawater spread all over the North Atlantic, which supports previous studies using effective tracers, Lagrangian flow trajectories, and circulation models. Um, but most importantly, we can see that the hypothesized interior advective pathway branching from the deep western boundary current is supported by the velocity data here. Um, so basically, using all the observed salinity anomalies from the Ian for spatial analysis, our complex EOF, all the ghost ship transects throughout the ocean interior allow an interior spreading story to come to life, where we can use these velocity trajectories as well as these slices through the ocean to see the zonal and meridional extent of lavender seawater throughout the basin, where we can determine three generalized spreading pathways of lavender seawater to the subtropics. The first being the eastern subpolar route, where we find <coughs> lavender seawater to advect to the eastern subpolar North Atlantic, to the Erminger and Icelandic basins for the eastern boundary, um, and into the North Atlantic interior, steered most likely by the Mediterranean water overflow out from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, we see direct injection into the Atlantic interior, likely from injection by recirculations from offshooting from the subpolar gyre near the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or leakage from the western boundary around Flemish Cap or Grand Banks. Um, and lastly, of course, via western boundary advection um, through the deep western boundary current. And we see the interior recirculation along the interior pathway branching from the deep western boundary current near Cape Hatteras. So these pathways have previously been supported by a multitude of studies. Um, however, our work here uses the novel approach of looking at the observed convective anomalies along the constant density planes, which aids in the verification of all of these pathways. So all in all, we see that interior advective pathways likely play an important and influencing role on the advection of lavender seawater to the tropics, which potentially delays the communication of these subpolar waters to the lower latitudes, which now prompts the question, uh, if we observe lavender seawater over a vast majority of the North Atlantic, are these, inter these interior pathways as important <laughs> on the advection of subpolar water masses, and what is the role of these in the AMOC? Um, so now we segue back to the last part, um, which basically precedes all these other studies looking locally at 26 and a half north, starting with those observed convective signals that we see and kind of diving into those a little bit deeper. Um, so as I mentioned, this served as the motivation for all these studies, observing this, the complete passage of the lavender seawater signal at 26 and a half north. Um, and now that we understand where the signal came from, on what time scales it came from, and what it means, uh, we now investigate further on the deeper subpolar anomalies at this location and provide a 40 year overview of the region, focusing on decadal and interdecadal variability of the deep ocean signals. So as mentioned, the previous assessments have focused just on lavender seawater at this location, but as you can see here, that deep anom that the anomaly in temperature and salinity extends all the way down to the seafloor. Um, here at 26 and a half north, going not only through the lavender seawater layer, but through the deeper layers as well. Um, 
the minimum and the intermediate range associated with louder seawater convective signals, but the connection to the deeper anomalies still needs to be investigated. And so with all this, we can now question whether these non-local water masses advect with similar characteristics um, as the intermediate layers have. Um, are similar convective trends observed? And can we link this anomaly back to sub subpolar climate events? And so to do this, we do a deep dive into the 26 and a half north um, hydrographic line. So as mentioned previously, this line is a collaborative effort to monitor the strength of the AMA between NOAA AOML, UM Rosensteel, and the UK Southampton Rapid Program. It has quasi-annual hydrographic surveys starting from 1985, um, where we have kind of a spatially irregular sampling um, every six to nine months usually, but we do have some data gaps that occur of more than a year. But all in all, we provide continuous full depth CTD and oxygen data, as well as LADCP data, extending all the way to 69 West at most locations. Um, in addition to hydrographic surveys, there are subsurface tall moorings with temperature and salinity microcap profiles and pressure inverted agosounders, in which we use a um, bottom temperature as a seafloor measurement here. So, what we hope to do with all this data is to build a robust gap-free hydrographic time series using the hydrographic data, the western boundary mooring microcat data, and the reconstructed bottom temperature measurements from the pies along the transect. And basically, try to, our biggest caveat here is trying to make this a spatially cohesive and temporally cohesive um, assessment given the, vari the variability in the sampling here. So to do that, we divide the entire transect into three separate zones. First zone uh, encompasses the deep western boundary current, and this is what was previous, previously explored um, in the first part. Um, we now break the entire line into three zones, uh, deep western boundary current, the middle zone, and the offshore zone, and these are separated based on sampling um, temporally and spatially within each zone. So these zones are also supported by um, zonal and meridional velocities, where you can see the core of the deep western boundary current here. Um, in our first zone, the opposing northward flow of the Abaco gyre in the middle zone, and the influence of the subtropical gyre in the offshore. So. Now within each zone, we then need to start partitioning water masses. And so uh, <coughs> water masses are again defined in neutral density based on temperature and salinity signatures using all profiles across all three zones, um, where we define cohesive density uh, boundaries across that work across all three zones, not just uh, stratified to one. We also use, in addition to the temperature and salinity and density used, um, we also used a dissolved oxygen as well to help characterize that. And so using all that hydrographic data as well as historical water mass definitions, we um, introduce eight water mass layers here at the line. Um, we focus here only on the deep layers that are below 2,000 meters. The lower intermediate, the deep, abyssal, and Antarctic bottom water. And so, looking at these deep layers, we can see right off the bat that there is significant cooling and freshening of all of these deep layers. Um, shown here is the intermediate layer, which we touched on in the first part, the lava seawater layer, which as we know, we saw the minimum in temperature and salinity, and that was attributed to the onset of this lava seawater convective class passing through. However, the deep layers right below that, deep abyssal and Antarctic bottom water, tell a completely different story. We see continual freshening and cooling, um, which is very interesting. And so to dive into this a little further, shown here are distance and time graphs across all three zones. Um, going forward in time, where you can see the anomaly and salinity across all three zones. So starting with the intermediate layer here, as was presented in the first part, where we focus solely on the deep western boundary current, um, the complete passage of that climate signal was observed and the return to warm and saline conditions. Um, conversely, in the deep vessel in an Antarctic bottom water layers, we see a slow progression and a continual freshening um, observed with no rebound yet. So now to kind of beef up the irregular CTD um, sampling that we have. We incorporate the um, western boundary mooring temperature and salinity data 
as well as bottom temperature measurements from the pies um, array shown here, the four moorings and four co-located pies, where again, we see the same validation and results where in our intermediate layer, we see the minimum in lab or seawater and then the rebound after that signal passes. Um, and then in the deep layers, we see continual freshening and cooling. Um, looking at the pies bottom temperatures, this is the first use of um, this pies bottom temperature time series across multiple locations at this latitude, which is something cool. Um, and we observe cooling at the site A2, B, and D, which are our inshore sites. Um, however, at site E, it's kind of difficult to discern the variability. Um, and it appears that it looks like a sinusoidal decadal pattern that we're starting to see. However, we do need a lot more continuous data to kind of validate that. So it's critical that we get observations in the future. Um, but one thing to note is that previous studies have, have uh, shown that Antarctic bottom water has been warming. Um, but we do not see that here. So whether or not we're just not observing true Antarctic bottom water this close into shore uh, is one option, or maybe we're just seeing something different with the longer time series. So that's something to follow up in the future as well. Um, so since we see this continual cooling and freshening at 26 and a half north, that questions, do we see this deep signal in the salt polar region? Does it hail from there? Or does this, does this change mark a completely different era to the deep ocean regime in this sector of the Atlantic? Like what, what is going on here? And so shown here, we can look at upstream um, locations, Bermuda, Cape Cod, Labrador Sea, Ermanger, and Icelandic Basin. And we see the same freshening event occur at all these locations, which can stem back to the Labrador Sea occurring in the mid 90s. Um, shown here are mean salinities of depths greater than 2000, 2000 meters. And you can see that in the Icelandic, Ermanger, and Labrador Sea, the source regions, or the subpolar regions, we can see that there's continual freshening occurring up until about 2000, which is linked to um, positive NAO uh, periods. Which shown here are the decadally average um, NAO indexes in the gray. And so we can assume that that is likely in a response to that positive state. Um, however, this extreme freshening is then followed by a rebound in salinification after the year 2000. So now when we look downstream at Cape Cod, Bermuda, and Abaco, we see continual freshening occurring with no rebound in sight. So the question is, will we see that same prolonged signal um, as we see upstream in the source region, or can we expect um, kind of a return to sailing conditions uh, 26 and a half north in the coming decade? And only continued observations will tell that too. So lastly, some conclusions. In part two, we observed a complete passage of the Labrador seawater convective signal through the deep western boundary current at 26 and a half north. We updated convective time scales of Labrador seawater based on the new decade of hydrographic data um, and showed that when you look at the pieces within the layer, you start to see different convective stories. Um, we also hypothesized that due to the varying convective time scales um, and the simultaneous arrival of the signal at Bermuda and Abaco, an alternative interior advective pathway branching from or completely separate from the deep western boundary current was likely to exist. So in part three, we then looked across the entire North Atlantic, um, showing that there were indeed multiple pathways of Labrador seawater uh, that it takes to get to the, sub the subtropical North Atlantic, um, flowing to the eastern subpolar, uh, through the Atlantic interior and equator right along the boundary confirm the presence of a recirculating pathway branching from the deep western boundary current, and we showed that there was an abundance of labor seawater within the Atlantic interior, not just along the western boundary, suggesting that these interior pathways play a significant role on the export of these subpolar climate signals. And lastly, we observed 40 years of significant deep ocean freshening and cooling at 26 and a half north um, via shipboard hydrography and the continuous mooring and bottom temperature arrays. The upstream investigation finds the same salinity anomaly to occur at locations in Bermuda, Cape Cod, and in the subpolar North Atlantic, which stems from the Labrador Sea in the 90s, likely linked to the positive NAO states. 
Um, however, whether or not the similar salinity rebound in the deep ocean can be expected off of Abaco remains a question of interest and whether or not it could have the potential to disrupt future AMOC assessments. And so to completely summarize all findings here, we see that subpolar convective signals are coherent across the Atlantic domain. They're not uh, you know, diluted out by different water masses. We're able to pinpoint them um, and use them as a vector tracers to study the AMOC lower limb. The deep ocean boundary current is not the sole means of exporting louder seawater to the subtropics. Interior pathways are shown to be largely responsible. And continued efforts to understand the importance of these interior advective pathways on the equator where direction of the subpolar climate signal will not only provide insights to future AMOC estimates and related variability, but also kind of explain or offer explanations to the dynamics between labrador seawater and Mediterranean water, um, as well as in the driving implications of NAO on this advection. But we must stress that hydrographic observations must continue into the future and validation of these pathways, time scales, and density classes with models is also critical as well. And so with that, I wanna give a shout out to all my collaborators. Um, and if you're interested, come to the defense for more. Yeah, very nice. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Questions from the audience here? No questions? Oh, yes, Shane. So do I need to come to your defense to see the link between what you presented yes. and the actual yes. time series of the AMOC at 26 now? No. Well, sure. I'll try to work on that. <laughs> no, but uh, so I'm just wondering, is this something to come or is it something? Uh, something to come, for sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, this is the last part I just presented. It's kind of a recent thing and still developing. So, okay. yeah, definitely leaves a lot more questions than answers. So. Is that another question? It coming? is another question. Okay, yes. But I don't want to take, you know. No, no, it's your question. So I think it's very cool that you use the temperature from the pies. Did you have to do an absolute calibration from yes. one deployment to the next? Yes, so the, the PIES deployments themselves are you know, separated in time, um, and each deployment is you know, very different in its calibration. So they're calibrated to CTD measurements that are within five kilometers of the actual PIES location, um, and they're calibrated based on the chunks of time, but also cohesively across the entire like, climatological CTD. Stuff that we have. Great. Yeah. Yes. So um, it went by a little bit fast, but um, can you comment on the fact that you know s some studies show warming during different decades and, and increases, ha and you're looking at a much more comprehensive study over a longer period of time? Do you find, even though you're finding cooling and freshening over the long time scale, do you do you find that you're getting consistent things when you compare to the time periods that people have analyzed? Deep in the missile water mass yeah. So, I mean, you're looking at two separate regimes, basically. You have your subpolar deep water and you have your Antarctic deeper water that's going to be there. Um, both have different sources, different properties. Um, so, based on the conclusions of my results alone, it's very difficult to kind of determine what to answer those questions. Um, I think we need to really pinpoint the whether or not Antarctic bottom water that we define based on the known temperature definition and then plus the density definition, if that is indeed true Antarctic bottom water, or if it's some subtropical modified version because it's so near shore. Um, so whether or not, like as I showed with site E, the pies it kind of looked like a sinusoidal as a cato fluctuation. So whether or not, you know, we're seeing pulses of Antarctic bottom water making its way there, and then one year it's not. It's we need a lot more data to kind of validate that, I think. Arthur has a question in Zoom. Um, that was an excellent seminar. Uh, very good uh, research, uh, very nice graphics. One of the better seminars I've seen here in quite a while. Yes. Um, so we're getting into the interior pathways. Do you think it's being driven by episodic alignment of energetic mesoscale ed eddies 
uh, creating efficient highways for these traces to go from north to south. This has been documented in the Gulf of Mexico in the surface, more closer to the surface waters. And I'm, I'm, I think in uh, this area, which is very eddy rich, you know, the Gulf Stream, stream and region, uh, current ring region that these uh, water masses are going through, do you, do you think it's episodic? Do you think it could be super juxtapositions that really help bring a lot of water down? And it may not be as continuous as we like to make our systems, but it could be more of a series of discrete pulses. Yeah, I mean, if we can say that mesoscale eddies can efficiently transport and move water masses that are, you know, between 1,500 meters and you know, the seafloor, I guess, even, um, then of course that's a viable option. Um, with my studies alone, I filter all of, you know, any um, stuff out of the hydrographic data itself. So this is kind of a, uh, I don't want to call it a smoothed approach, but it, you're omitting the mesoscale component to that. Um, but it is something critical to, to look into, definitely, and whether or not models can correctly capture that um, is also interesting. Yeah, that, that, that would be the next step, mm -hmm. is to get the output of one of the better data assimilative models that have assimilated all the, the data and see, you know, the pathways the Labrador sea water is taking in those models. Absolutely. But well, whether or not those models can accurately portray Labrador sea water um, is, you know, kind of a question, which I've found throughout this whole dissertation processes a lot of the models don't really show what the observations show so that's yeah it's all the whole study in, in itself um, so yeah. well it's good that you now have the observations to keep the models on it absolutely yeah thank you for a good seminar thank you okay uh, I don't see any further questions in zoom or here so uh, thank you again Thank you all for coming. The next seminar is tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 here in this room, the first of two ATM faculty candidates. Please come again. <laughs>